Hello, my name is Matthew Reiskin, and I'm truly honored to be with you for today's webinar entitled Turning Design on Its Head, featuring Technion Dean of Architecture and Town Planning, Professor Yasha Grobman. Thank you all for joining us. I'm especially pleased to be participating in this particular webinar, the 14th in the Live from Technion webinar series, <clears throat> because of my family's long connection to the Technion, particularly the Faculty of Architecture. My late father, Leon Reiskin, established the Israel and Leon Reiskin Fellowship Fund in Architecture and Town Planning in 1998, in honor of his father, who had supported the Technion before the founding of the State of Israel. My brothers and I are proud to continue our father's tradition of supporting the Technion through this award, which is known as Israel's most prestigious undergraduate student architectural award, recognizing innovative and socially responsible thesis projects. Like my father, I am a practicing architect, a principal in the Washington DC office of Smith Group. Our firm has expanded what architecture means and today employs research, data-driven design and advanced technologies to help clients solve their greatest challenges. This is perfectly in line with the vision that Professor Yasha Grobman has for the faculty. And it's an important distinction for a faculty that is the oldest at the Technion, founded when the university's doors opened in 1924. Today, the Technion's Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning is a prestigious and unique institution for the training of architects, landscape architects, industrial designers, and regional and urban planners. Three years ago, on the occasion of our son's bar mitzvah, my family visited the school, and we are thrilled to meet with administration, faculty, and winners of our family prize. The school is vibrant, full of ideas and enthusiasm, and we are proud to be among its supporters, who also include David Bacalar, Mickey and Dave Donahoe, the Carplus family, Yosef Lind and the FS Foundation, and Michael Klein and Les Seskin, both of whom I believe are on today's call. Under Professor Groban's guidance, the faculty is developing innovative architectural design and manufacturing tools using, <coughs> using virtual reality for gauging emotional reactions to space and developing things like cactus-inspired heat resistance materials. Excuse me. Professor Yasha Grobman was born in Moscow, graduated from the Israeli Air Force Flight Academy, and then served in the Israeli Air Force. He earned his bachelor's degree from Bezalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem, his master's degree from the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London, and his doctorate from the Technion. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design before jo joining the Technion faculty in 2010. In addition to his deanship, Professor Grobman is also the founding director of the Technion Computer Oriented Design Laboratory called T Code and is an award winning architect and founder of Grobman Architects. He is co author of the 2011 book Performalism Between Form, Function, and Performance in Contemporary Architecture and the author or editor of nearly 80 books, book chapters, and refereed publications. As a practicing architect, his projects often test the real life viability of his research. The Porter School of Environmental Studies building uh, he designed at Tel Aviv University won an international design competition for sustainability. Following the presentation, we'll have time for questions from you. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your webinar screen to submit any questions during this program. We'll be asking as many of those questions as possible until we conclude the program at 12.45 p.m. Eastern Time. This presentation is also being recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next few days. I'm now delighted to turn the program over to Professor Yasha Grobman. Yasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, very excited to be here. Um, as you know, here in Israel, we are in lockdown. And it's, it's a kind of a virtual refreshing moment for me to be with you in Los Angeles, forgetting a little bit uh, uh, our not easy period in Israel of staying at home, being a father, being a Zoom teacher, uh, a partner and a dean together. So uh, I thank you for uh, the invitation and I hope uh, you enjoy my presentation. What I'm 
going to do in the presentation is um, present the faculty and architecture for a little different point of view. Usually when we talk about the faculty of architecture and town planning, we show buildings, we show, we talk about building design and we, uh, and we disregard the other departments or the other more scientific uh, direction. And I'm as a dean trying to uh, um, develop the faculty into this direction, into high tech, into technology and be more what I called a technion faculty. There are six others, there are gonna be uh, six schools of architecture at Israel soon, and each of them needs to find its way. And I believe that the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning at the Technion needs to focus on the Technion direction, which is more technological one. So what you're gonna show in this presentation, it's a various scale of research project that deal with what I call a revolution in architecture. And I mean the, the uh, very uh, wide definition of the word architecture. So I'm gonna share with you uh, my screen. and start the presentation. So um, I'm gonna, uh, after this very nice presentation by Matthew, I don't have a lot to say about myself, but I show you some pictures that will maybe show you uh, a side of me, which is unique. Then I'll talk about the Technion and the faculty, and uh, I'll give you a background of what I call a revolution in architecture and design. Uh, and I will show you several case studies in architecture landscape and industrial design. And at the end, I cannot uh, um, stop without saying a word about uh, COVID-19. So uh, me, I was born in Russia uh, into a in very artistic family. My father is a painter and my mother is a graphic designer and an editor of a journal or an artistic journal. And uh, that's, that's our house in Moscow in the 70s. And now we can imagine uh, the Soviet regime did not hold us. We were not, uh, my parents were not uh, science scientists or uh, rocket engineers. So when they wanted to go to Israel, we were one of the first that allowed to go to Israel. And I became this normally Israeli uh, boy, a bit shamed of his Russian uh, uh, origins because at that time in Israel, you're supposed to be a Sabra, an Israeli. I lost that shame when I joined the Air Force. I was flying F 15s, and, uh, uh, and that is the, my background, my family background, and my later military background. I kind of present presenting what I am. I'm a combination of something I think that uh, that believes in art and in artistic creation, but also very technological and technical guy. And that's why I chose architecture. So my professional, uh, the, my academic career uh, was uh, very nicely described by Matthew, and I want to describe it again. And I'm I'm trying to combine architecture research in my lab. I'm uh, uh, right now I'm the Dean of the faculty, so I have a, a lot of administrative work. And once in a while, when I get bored, I do a competition, architectural competition. And if I'm very lucky, I win the project. And then I uh, reform my, uh, uh, my practice and design and build the building. And the Portland building that the Matthew mentioned is an example. So that's me, the Faculty of Architecture at the Technion, for those of you who haven't been there, is uh, at Haifa on the mountain. You can see the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, the faculty is sitting together with a, a mathematic camp, uh, faculty. That's mathematics. That's the Faculty of Architecture. A little bit of history. Yes, the building was started in 1914. It's opened in 1924. So uh, in two years or a bit more, we're gonna have 100 year celebration of the Technion. And the first faculty of the Technion was the building faculty 
in which, which is architecture and building construction. This is how it looks in the 1930s. And these are the first uh, graduate of the school. And pay attention to this. Uh, the Technion was one of the only school in the world around that time that allow female students to study engineering. And that's one of the first graduate in engineering in Israel in the first uh, uh, graduate course at our faculty. So uh, some numbers. Uh, we have, as Matthew said, four departments. We have about 1,000 students. The Technion has around 20,000 and we have 18 faculties. From those are 600 undergraduate, 400 graduate, uh, master and PhD. We have around fa 70 faculty members, 20, 28 researchers, 12 practic practitioners, and 30 administrative. I, I rounded all the numbers, so don't catch me in one number or the other. We have extra 250 adjunct faculty. That's our practitioners that come in to teach. And um, we released uh, 160 graduate students each year, 70 architects, 30 landscape architects. We are the only school uh, in Israel that uh, uh, teach landscape architecture currently. And we have 10 PhDs and 50 master's students. And in terms of productivity, we are very, very, very productive. Besides teaching, we uh, produce 140 scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals each year, 40 research grants and three patents because we shift into technology and to patents. So that's who, who we are. What we did in the last years, we developed the green code for Israel that uh, faculty members, uh, Gedi Capelluto, Edna Shaviv, and Avram Gejioro. We developed the Israel 2020 uh, master plan and we're currently working on the 2048. By the way, in 2048, everything in Israel is supposed to be doubled. All the buildings are supposed to be doubled. The population will double and we basically need to design and build another country. That's what we in 2048 and we are uh, leading by Professor Shamaya Sif uh, working on it. We uh, did the first Israeli marine plan. These are the uh, teachers that were recipients of the Israeli Prize of Architecture and they built the seminal building in Israel as the Supreme Court, the Tel Aviv Museum, and the Jerusalem Museum. So that was a short introduction of the faculty. And uh, for those of you who are not within the inner circle of uh, uh, the Technion uh, uh, and our faculty. So I'm now shifting into the main uh, uh, subject of the faculty. And I'm talking about the challenges in architecture and design in the 21st century. And if you look at the first studio and you see what they're doing, that's a picture taken from uh, 90, 20 something. Uh, and you see that drawing. If you look at Norman Foster's office and you uh, disregard the models and the computer, you basically see they're doing the same, it's just drawing with computer. So the, the architect product, what architect delivers until now, until recently was this a paper and then uh, somebody, the builder, supposed to take this paper and use it to build something. This has a lot of implication in terms of responsibility, in terms of uh, 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 money, liability, and payment. And right now it's all changing. So I'm going to talk about this change in the next five minutes in this change before I go into uh, our research project that are based on this change. I'm going to explain shortly uh, why I think it's a change or a revolution. So first of all, uh, the first uh, revolution is the represent representation. We need to build the building twice. We need to build a virtual building and then a physical building. And well, it, it's not a surprise for people that you know, work in the car industry or airplane industry. You will not get in an airplane if you wouldn't know that somebody has built it virtually and tested several times. It's not the case in buildings. So building has shifted into a new type of software called BIM since already a couple of years. And this software allow us not only to design, but also to simulate and uh, basically test the building 
before we build it. So we build the building twice. And then the paradigm shift is instead of we produce the paper, give somebody to build it, we design, we produce the model, and then I'll talk about the robots or somebody else that build it. Basically, we are directly responsible uh, for the building of the environment. The second revolution talks about the simulation. If you think of uh, 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 how uh, you grew up, how architects are, uh, were supposed to evaluate, they say, I feel that the building needs to be like that. I'm, according to my experience, uh, the light would be enough. I think the acoustic will be fine. I'll put something here and there. But this is not, uh, uh, not the case anymore. Architect and designer have the power to empirically optimize our building. So we can check the structure, we can check the acoustics, we can look at the wind, and uh, we can test it, we can evaluate it, and we can optimize it and make it better. Not only that, we are able to be to feel the building. Right now, VR technology allow us to be immersed in the building. And, and it's so, the, the, the feeling is so intense that look at these people, they're actually falling. They are feeling it within the environment. So we can not only uh, uh, design and optimize the building, we can make, we can test them ourselves. We can test the feelings. The third and final revolution is the revolution uh, uh, that is connected to the fabrication. As I mentioned earlier, we will be responsible over the fabrication of the building, not the builder, we, because we produce the file that goes directly into the machine that builds. So uh, you all know 3D printing and there's a lot of uses for 3D printing uh, 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 that you see here. Also building elements, but not only building elements, also entire building. If you look at these companies in China, they actually 3D print. I'm sure most of you have seen these pictures and I'll show you how it works. Uh, these big machines, pour concrete uh, like this and basically create building. It's not, uh, it's, it, it's not omnipresent. It's a new technology. It has a lot of difficulties, but if you think of the future, uh, a lot of people claim that this will be the future, that the building will be built on site by this type of machines. So, but it's not only concrete. We can do it uh, also with uh, uh, metal. These are 3D printers, pr printers that uh, print metal and you can do a uh, structure with it. Uh, and there are some uh, project already uh, in Netherlands that uh, 3D printed a bridge, a whole bridge metal bridge uh, with this and it goes like this is an example and then that's the way that the bridge is being printed. So, um, so uh, just go back. So uh, what, what I'm gonna show that that was my uh, short explanation about what I see as the leading revolutions in architecture and design. What I want to show you is several case, uh, case studies of research in the faculty in different scale from different directions from different departments that are using this new knowledge, using these new tools of architects uh, and designers and create groundbreaking designs, groundbreaking research to promote the, the, what I call the discipline. And uh, architects are all, we're always a good integrator. We know, as a lot of people say, we know little about many things and that's why we are excellent integrators. And most of the project, the architect integrates people from different disciplines, brings the new idea and creates not innovative project. So for example, we talked about representation and uh, um, the, this project by Professor Yuda Kalai and Davide Schumann argues that we can measure human behavior. Uh, for example, in a hospital, a nurse walks around 10 miles every day. Imagine if you would, would test 
the design beforehand and reduce this uh, uh, distance. You get a much uh, uh, refreshed nurses, a better treatment, and less people will die in hospital. Think of this also in, related to, in relation to corona. You can test the building and test how people behave in the building. So this is a way to use simulation in design. Another example in this direction is a project by uh, Ezra Ozeri, which is a student of Professor Tarazi's uh, uh, lab. He has a, a, a sad uh, story with his father that had some accidents. So he designed a game that would help his father to go over the limitations. And I'm gonna show you now a short video of one minute uh, that explains the project. So we're not doctors, and, uh, uh, but we as architects and designers know space, know a little bit about VR and know how people behave and we can make this connection in this type of project. A different project, a uh, different research project by uh, Professor Asaf schwartz lab looks at uh, uh, biodiversity and there is a a crisis in biodiversity, as everybody know. And in Israel, a, a very small land with a, a lot of uh, uses, uh, this uh, crisis getting very, very, um, is getting harder. And Asaf has an idea to check how we can uh, uh, use corridors to allow animal movement and basically fight this biodiversity. But the question was, how do you measure it? How do you know if it works? So they use a system called Atlas, which they, they connect to all kinds of wildlife and then check whether uh, and how uh, uh, the wildlife, similar, similar to the way Kalai's work, how the wildlife consume nature and then they can basically design agriculture and design these passages uh, much better. So uh, you see all, all the birds that they caught and tagged and they follow them since April 2000 and they already have a, a huge database that helps them to uh, help the Israeli government to better control agriculture, better control, control planning. Uh, one of my projects talks about the connection between architectural space and human emotion. I want you all to uh, look for a second, not at your screen, but look around and look at the ceiling and the walls of the places that you sit in. And ask yourself, what if the ceiling was a bit higher? What if the wall was a little bit tilted? Was it better? or not? Would I feel better or not? That's the next stage of simulation, simulating how the space affects us, how we feel in the space. And this was our challenge. What, what, why it's important? Imagine we can do classroom in which 
uh, students and kids study better because the space, the geometry makes them more relaxed. Or uh, from another point of view, imagine that we can create spaces which makes you feel uncomfortable and you won't go there. Secure for spaces for security, for example. So we were trying to map this uncharted area and we used all kinds of equipment to tag into people's feeling like GSR, which is kind of a lie detector, EEG, we look at where people are, are, are viewing, eye tracking. And of course, everything was in VR environment. We had this uh, setup of uh, students and other people that go in and walk into this type of spaces, very, very simple type of spaces in which we changed a little bit. We changed the width, we changed the height, and we changed the curvature a little bit and protrusion. And we see how people reacted. That was never done before. And, and we discovered many things. That, that's, by the way, uh, this is, I think, the only graph that I'm showing in the presentation. So I don't expect you to understand. But just to see how we uh, see uh, the way people look and where do they look according to the space. And all the data are synchronized. And from that, we are extracting a lot of information about how people feel in the space. So we, we realized that, of course, there is a connection between emotion and architectural space. We realize this empirically. We can prove it. We see that there is a gap between what people think and, by, and what people uh, uh, actually feel, because we also ask people to write what they think about the space. We, for example, see that narrow structures produce a negative effect, which is even more negative than that of a low ceiling. For example, if you have to choose between the two as architect, what would you do? So here we have a rule. And we have a, a other uh, a conclusion about uh, criteria for protrusions and any, many other uh, details about spaces. Of course, it's just the first step, but it gives you an understanding how people feel in the space. So uh, that is the research is going on. Another totally different direction in our school are robots. As I mentioned, we, are, we think, we believe that robots would play a big role in architecture. This was already uh, thought of at the 90s, but then they didn't have the software and uh, uh, computer intelligence for that. Right now, we believe that we have. So we teach our students, as you see here in Professor Sprecher lab, how to work with robots as extension to your hand or to the worker hands. And also we do all kinds of scientific research, for example, how you uh, are gonna use robot as a tool for excavating large area in order not to save the land move from place to another. When you do a building, there's a lot of excavation, a lot of land move, then if you can use the robot as a tool to move the land, you can save that and create a complex uh, geometry that saves the land and, does, uh, and, and saves the, the need to move uh, uh, all the, uh, uh, the, the ground. Um, next project, the next case studies is uh, uh, an interesting case study about 3D printing a coral reef. As you know, there's a huge problem of coral Color, coral reef bleaching. And uh, uh, this group, again by Professor Ezri Tarazi, decided to use 3D printers to, uh, to try to mitigate between these uh, uh, areas with, uh, where the coral reef is uh, dead to, uh, you know, to the time where coral can uh, revitalize itself. So they use a 3D printer, one of our big 3D printers to uh, print in clay. And uh, they use all kinds of uh, geometries to do that, that are coming from the needs of fish and other uh, uh, marine animals. I'm not gonna go into details here. And then they uh, built this column prototype. And I'm gonna show you again, a one minute video about that.
Okay, the next project, uh, again from my lab, talk, talks about the wall, basic architectural wall. If you think of a wall, the, the, the fundamental structure of the wall didn't change. It's a laminated entity made from different layers of different material, materials. This is an ancient building, but if you think of your wall and where you sit, it's again, it's a laminated entity. And uh, this is like a section of uh, high tech new wall where uh, the materials are more expensive and more complex, but basically it's a laminated geometry. And if you look at nature, and if you look at, look at envelopes of nature, they look totally different. They are homogeneous in terms of material, but very articulated in terms of geometry. So we had the idea, why don't we use uh, ideal from nature and create this type of uh, building facades that will perform like nature, that in Israeli harsh weather will be able to withstand the heat like cacti, or uh, later I'll show you, uh, they'll be able to behave like a fur. So we scan, 3D scan cacti and produces tile from it. We uh, uh, took, uh, uh, we tested furs and we created different tiles. We tested Montbero and uh, uh, we created a tile that is inspired by Montbero, which is very, very strong. And we took all these 3D printed tiles and uh, start checking them physically in a wind lab, in a wind turbine lab. And uh, we saw how the wind behave next to this envelope. The idea is if you stop the air, uh, air that is stopped is basically isolated air. It's the isolation, thermal isolation. So uh, we checked how air behave in uh, different types of facades and we created a, a simulation model of this behavior. And then we start checking hundreds of different tiles geometry to see which one performs better in terms of thermal isolation. These are all checks. And uh, we discovered that a uh, very interesting thing. First of all, we discovered we can save, we can increase the thermal behavior of a facade by 25% just by changing the geometry. But the interesting uh, thing about this that it's counter, counter uh, intuitive because usually when you increase the surface of a, of a surface, you increase the area of a surface, it loses uh, temperature, it loses uh, heat like a radiator, but not in several of the, the geometries that we tasted like cactus and others, for example. So, uh, so, so, th so this for us is a very interesting project and we are trying now to extend it and to enlarge it in the bigger scale and produce actually uh, uh, building tiles that are made from different geometries inspired by nature. So what I want you to remember from all these projects, I want you to remember that the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning is leading interdisciplinary research projects in various fields and scales. Architecture is not just about buildings. And the way we communicate, build, and evaluate architecture and design is changing. It's a new revolution, and we are just in the beginning. So I couldn't help myself, and I had to uh, add some final remarks about the connection to COVID-19. So we, uh, uh, COVID-19 hit Israel in beginning of March, end of, end of February, and we went very fast into lockdown. We were thinking, 
what can we do in order to turn this lemon into lemonade? And we were doing think tanks in order to uh, create ideas of, uh, uh, of, of using our expertise to help the uh, fight against COVID-19. So some of the projects that we invented were, for example, this suit that was printed and, and manufactured in our lab. It's a suit that, that is located between the fully, uh, um, um, fully protective suit, which is very heavy and uncomfortable, to the suit without ventilation. It has a ventilation on batteries and it helps uh, uh, medical uh, staff to be more mobile. This thing works today in Rambam Hospital and helps our medical staff to actually fight Corona. And I hope this has a lot of, it has uh, some of uh, the credit for the low number of mortality in Israel. And then we were thinking we began project which is a, are a bit longer in terms of uh, 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 time to, uh, uh, to finish. We were thinking about uh, um, how we need to rethink the public space, uh, how we can use roads, sidewalks to, uh, uh, to, to, to have a better environment where cars are not working and everything is in lockdown. And there are some projects that are starting to develop a new urban planning method and rules that are based on what is called tactical urbanism. And of course, we need to think of the way we use our homes, because especially now when I'm in a lockdown and I don't live in a big house, I live in a flat with a small roof garden in Tel Aviv, we need to think of how we use this very, very precious uh, uh, public or semi-public area, external area, uh, to make our life a little bit better in this COVID-19 environment. And uh, uh, people rediscovered balconies, rediscovered the spaces, and we as an architect have an obligation to rethink the way we design building in light of uh, what we learned in this few months. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Yasha. That was, um, as a practicing architect, I have to say that was really uh, um, inspiring. It really, uh, you know, made me feel enthusiastic about the kind of work that's going on in the universities and um, that your faculty is pioneering. It was rather amazing. Um, we have just a, a couple of minutes for questions um, that I'm going to dive right into. Les Seskin has asked about how the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning interfaces with civil and structural, mechanical and electrical faculties. If there's any coordination there. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's one of my main aims. We actually promote now uh, mutual courses. We have several courses that we do together, try to teach uh, engineers uh, how architects think and vice versa. Uh, you know, my presentation shows that the tools, the format, the way we work is getting closer to engineers and we can finally speak the same language and understand each other. So I'm not saying that we are gonna replace them, but we're gonna to come to them with help uh, while we are a little bit more fine-tuned with our ideas. So yes, that's a high priority on my list as a dean. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I think that uh, certainly when you're practicing architecture, you spend a lot of time coordinating with engineers and. Um, the earlier it happens, the better, because that's when some real innovation happens instead of just simply um, powering or heating your design. Um, so I, I think that kind of collaboration is really um, uh, significant to learn in school. A um, couple of other questions. Um, uh, are there advancements being made in school about um, architecture for people with uh, physical challenges, uh, special needs? 
Yes, of course. I saw I show one presentation by Ezra Ozeri that uh, deals with pe people with special needs, physical movement needs after operation. But we also have a special studio for the elderly. We think that our population is getting older and older, and we need to rethink the way we design our building that will suit people uh, that are older now. Uh, everybody, uh, we all uh, live longer, happily, and we are more active, but we need to consider how, uh, how we uh, design our, not only homes, but also environments, because right now, at least in Israel, all the, um, the neighborhoods are quite similar. We, we all create this five-story building, sorry, five-room, five-bedroom, four-bedroom uh, uh, apartments for families, and if you want to live with your, uh, you know, as a, as a elder, if you want to live with your family in this neighborhood, you have to buy yourself this huge apartment with, the, you know, too big for you. So we need to rethink the way we design for uh, people with disability and for the elder. Excellent. Um, now, I think uh, you wanted to say a few words about a design competition you are hosting. Oh, um, yes. Uh, we are uh, right now, we moved to the Technion Hill at 1984 or five, and we are guests at the uh, Faculty of Mathematics. And right now we are, uh, we receive a very, very gracious donation by uh, the Goldberg family to build a pavilion, which will be ours to host our master program. But at the end, we don't have a building. We don't have a building of architecture. So now, so we're trying to be proactive uh, as we are not in the first priority of the Technion, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, let's say, computer science or more technologically uh, centered the faculties. And we promote uh, a competition for a new building for the Faculty of Architecture that was the first uh, faculty uh, at the Technion. Hopefully it will be finished by uh, the 100 to the Technion and the faculty will have the first faculty will finally have a building uh, on its own that will be connected to this complex in which uh, uh, the Goldberg Pavilion and the Sego uh, building are. And certainly we can appreciate the, um, the irony of uh, the architecture school not having a building of its own and, um, and the pride and importance of that. So I think um, it's 12.45, time for us to wrap this up. Thank you very much, Yasha. I found this absolutely um, invigorating and, and fascinating. And I'm sure that everybody who participated on this found the, found the same. Um, as a reminder, the presentation has been recorded. A link will be sent to you within the next couple of days. You'll receive an invitation to upcoming programs in our Live from Technion webinar series. Thank you for joining us and stay safe. And thank you for being part of our American Technion Society network of friends and supporters. L'shana tova to you and your family. Thank you very much.